Hello everyone, this is Professor Keen and this is Introduction to Astronomy. For the first two weeks of this course, we primarily spent our time familiarizing ourselves with the night sky. In particular, we learned a little bit about how the motion of the sun and the moon and the stars follow predictable patterns from day to day and from month to month and from year to year. Now we are going to begin our study of geocentrism, that is the philosophy that claims that the Earth is truly at the center of the world, or we might say the center of the universe. This view was really the prevalent view from ancient times up until the modern era, which begins around the 1600s. It was the traditional view, and it was really based on common sense. After all, the argument that the geocentrists make is that we, you and I, feel like we are sitting still, and it looks like the sun, the moon, and the stars are going around us, so they are. It's a very common sense view. Things are the way that they seem. When astronomers like Copernicus later on in the 1540s start arguing that the sun and the moon and the sun and the moon and the stars um, are not going around the earth, rather the earth is going around the sun, they really had to argue against common sense. So what we want to do right now is study a little bit more carefully the arguments for geocentrism that were presented by its defenders. So we're going to turn to one of the most prominent defenders of geocentrism first. His name is Aristotle. He lived around between 384 to 322 BC. Those are rough dates. And what I'd like to do is give a little bit of background on his, um, his biography uh, before we start talking about his particular work we're going to be looking at. He was born in a Greek town of Stigira, which is located on the Aegean Sea, a little bit east of modern-day Thessaloniki. He was a student of Plato, another famous philosopher, and he was a teacher of Alexander the Great. Aristotle wrote about many things, logic, physics, medicine, metaphysics, the principles that underlie physics, ethics, politics, plants, animals, the soul, and his writings profoundly influenced much of Western philosophy. The reading selections that we're going to focus on in Introduction to Astronomy are from Book 1 of Aristotle's De Caelo, or On the Heavens, which was translated into English. In this book, Aristotle considers the heavens and the earth. What does he mean by that? Well, he, by heavens, he doesn't mean where your soul goes when you die. He means everything that is the moon and above. So in his perspective, the earth is at the center of the world, he would say. We would say the universe, he would say the world. The earth is at the center of the world, and the moon is going around the earth. Everything below the moon, the sublunary region, is the region of the earth. Everything the moon and above would be the region of the heavens. So what he is going to be interested in are questions like, what is the shape and the size and the makeup or the composition and the motion of the heavens. The heavens, as I said, refers to everything in that divine and unchangeable expanse which lies above the moon and above. Now, apart from the profound enjoyment of contemplating the nature of the heavens, studying Aristotle really has a number of practical benefits. First of all, it provides us with an occasion to read and to analyze the arguments of a very careful thinker. I want you to try to enter Aristotle's world See if his arguments are reasonable. Try to find weaknesses in them. Is he right or is he wrong in his conclusions? Are you sure? And if he's wrong, why is he wrong? Is it because of some wrong assumption that he's making or is it because he has reasoned incorrectly from his assumptions? You're going to notice, many of you, this is the first Aristotle you will have ever read. And it's a little bit challenging to read Aristotle, but it's very important to understand Aristotle because many of the later thinkers are directly responding to Aristotle. One of the things that makes him a little bit difficult to read is that he has a very strong interest in classification. So he likes to classify types of objects, types of motion, types of shapes. And for this reason, many beginners find reading him to be a little bit difficult. Try not to get overwhelmed. The difficulty is largely because of his classification schemes, and they're unlike the ones that we use today. For example, he classifies, and we'll talk more about this later, he classifies all types of motion into either straight, circular, or a combination of the two. And although scientists don't usually classify motion like this today, there are really some good reasons for him doing so. You might even discover that in many ways Aristotle is very modern in his thinking. And another benefit of reading Aristotle is that it's going to provide you a framework for understanding subsequent theories of the world. Indeed, as I mentioned a moment ago, many of the astronomers and scientists and thinkers develop their theories largely in response to Aristotle's ideas. So when we read Ptolemus, um, Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Kepler, their planetary theories are largely a reaction, either agreeing or disagreeing with Aristotle's ideas. So the better understanding you have of Aristotle, the more clearly you're going to understand the later thinkers that we encounter. Okay, having said that, let's take a look at chapter one of Aristotle's 
On the Heavens. In chapter one of On the Heavens, Aristotle begins talking about what he calls the science of nature. What does the science of nature study? He says, well, it studies a few different things. So first of all, it studies bodies. I'll just list what these are. Bodies, magnitudes, properties, and movements. So what does he mean by these things? Um, well, a body is a thing like you or like me or like a rock or a squirrel. It's something that we see in front of us, a body. What about a magnitude? A magnitude is a little bit more of an abstract concept because it basically consists of an extended object um, that has some limitations. So a magnitude, you can think about that as a measurement of the size of an object. So a, a you know, I am five foot eight inches tall. So my, that would be a magnitude, the extent of the height of my body. But a magnitude can also be an abstract concept. So if you take five foot eight inches and you take away my body and think of the magnitude in an abstract sense, that's a more broad understanding of magnitude. Properties, what are those? Well, the properties of something are the things that uh, it exhibits. So one of my properties is my height. Another property of me would be my skin color or my eye color or you know the way that uh, my haircut. Those are the various properties that I have. So any science of nature is going to study bodies, their magnitudes, their properties, and their movements as well. So movements are any kind of change in that body or magnitude or property. So it's probably worthwhile mentioning at this point that by the word movement, Aristotle means something a little broader than what we mean by movement. So motion for Aristotle means any kind of change, not just a change in location. So we think of motion as motion from point A to point B or from Milwaukee to Madison. That would be a movement and motion for Aristotle, but that would be a locomotion, a motion in location. Another kind of motion would be something like from cold to hot. So if you heat up a cup of coffee, it is undergoing a motion from a state of coldness to a state of hotness or a movement from sickness to health by means of a doctor. That would be another motion for Aristotle. So it's good to keep in mind that when he speaks of movement or motion, he's basically talking about change in a broader sense. So the science of nature studies these four things and it also studies, he says, the principles, the principles of substances. Okay, so a substance would be um, like you are a substance, a squirrel is a substance, and what are the principles? What is it that underlies these substances? What are the things, the most essential things? What is the essence of to be you? What is the essence of a squirrel? What is the essence of a rock? These are the underlying principles of those substances, and any science of nature should address questions like that too. Okay? Um, the things that are constituted by nature, he says, things constituted by nature that is the things we see in nature, or the things that make up nature, we might say more broadly, things constituted by nature are, he says, first of all, bodies and magnitudes, bodies and magnitudes. So, you know, your body and your height, right? So I might say, um, um, my body, what you, what you see on your YouTube channel when I'm sitting in front of the, TV, in front of the camera. Um, another thing that exists in nature or that constitutes nature are things that possess bodies and magnitudes. Now this is a distinction that he's careful to make. So when you see me, you see my body, but um, I have a body. So the word I, that would be the thing that possesses that body, that has that body. Okay. So there's a notion of I, and I am not reducible strictly to my body. Okay, so, and I am part of nature. I am part of nature, not just my body being part of nature. And finally, the principles of things that possess these. Okay, so my body is a body of magnitude. I have a body. And what am, what am I? So what is the essence of me? Okay, so I, we can talk about me, I, that's the thing that possesses bodies and magnitude, but what are the principles underlying a human being? What is a human? And he would, uh, Aristotle would say a human is a rational animal. Those are the underlying principles that makes, that make me what I am. Okay, so this is just kind of a broad overview of the kinds of things that he is going to be thinking about when he's studying nature. 
Okay, what are some of the other terms that Aristotle uses? He talks about a continuum. You might have heard of this term before. What does he mean by a continuum? It's something that is always capable of subdivision or being divided. So if you take um, water, let's say, and you take this water and you divide it into two separate cups of water, you divided it, you subdivided it. And then you take each of those and you subdivide it again. And you take those and you subdivide it again. If something is truly a continuum, it can be subdivided continually. It can always be subdivided. There's no elementary atomic um, particles that make it up that themselves are not divisible. So that's what he means by a continuum. Okay. Um, he also is more specific about what he means by a body. So what is a body? A body, he says, is a thing that is every way divisible. So this would be continually divisible, continually divisible or subdivisible, you might say. And a body is an object that is divisible in every way. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Divisible in every way. Okay. So what do we mean by in every way? Well, he explains that he, he distinguishes a body from, from things that are not bodies. So a line, if you draw a line, right, um, that can only be divided in one way. That is, I can, I can break this line. I can draw a... Um, I can draw, I can cut it right here, right? And I can only divide it in one way because once I've divided it, I have a, a little point there. I can't divide that point anymore, okay? So a line is a magnitude that's divisible in one way. So a line is a magnitude divisible in just one way. On the other hand, a surface, if we go to a higher dimensionality, we've got the surface, let's say. Think about a sheet, a surface. Well, I can divide it this way, right? But I can also divide it this way. So you can divide it in two separate ways. So he would say that's a magnitude that's divisible in two ways. And then a body, he says, well, if you have a body, that is divisible in three ways, right? You can divide it um, kind of this way and this way and what did I forget? This way, right? So there's three ways you can divide it. It's a magnitude divisible in three ways, okay? And he goes on to say that there is nothing, you can't extend, like you can extend a line into a surface, you can extend a surface into a body, but you can't extend a body into anything else because there are only three dimensions in space. So a body is complete, you might say. So it's divisible in every possible way. And Aristotle goes on to say that the number three is really significant. It's significant in nature. So let me, it's the significance of the number three. Of the number three. Okay, why is this significant? Well, because as we just mentioned, nature, show, it, it's apparent in nature. By looking at nature, nature has three dimensions. Bodies are made of three dimensions. You might even think about it in a modern Cartesian way, the X, Y, and Z axes. So this number three shows up as an important feature of nature. But that's not the only significance of the number three. It's also significant in, in our language and in our thought, he says, because we can talk about things like the beginning and the middle and the end. So it seems like time, at least when we think about it, um, we think about it in three categories, either past, present, and future. So even in our language, um, this number three is significant. It also is significant when we talk about quantifying things. We can have one thing, we can have um, both things, and we can have all things. So kind of our, our laws of thought seem to be governed by the number three. And he also interestingly mentions that the number three shows up in the worship of gods, sort of a natural theology. We, uh, and the, the ancients, he says, saw the number three in nature and took a cue from that in understanding the nature of God or gods. Okay, so we follow the lead of nature, he says. I find that to be an interesting observation by Aristotle, who was himself not a Christian, um, and yet he has some understanding of the significance of the number three in the worship of God. And of course, for a Christian, this resonates because a Christian recognizes that, that we believe in the Trinity, right? So one God in three persons. So I don't know exactly what he's referring to. I'd love to hear more about what he's thinking about in this case. But, um, but I guess we have to stop there because we don't know um, what else he's thinking about. I should say also that um, he goes on to say that bodies are complete. I think I mentioned this a moment ago, they're complete and that they have three dimensions. He would say that they're perfect or complete, that is they lack nothing, okay? So um, lines and, surface and surfaces in this sense are defective because they lack one of their dimensions, but a body is perfect, not insofar as it's not corruptible or something like that, but it's perfect in that it's not lacking in any dimension.
Okay. He also goes on to say that bodies are determined or delineated by what are adjacent to them. So if you have one body and you want to know um, the edges of it, well, you have to look at what's next to it. And th those boundaries between that body and the next body um, distinguish or delineate the different bodies. Okay. And then, and now where is he going with all this stuff? He goes on to say by the end of this chapter that the whole universe is made up of all of the bodies which comprise it. And so the universe is complete. Okay, so he's sort of just at this point, he's just building up some language and some ways of thinking about things so that he can begin talking about the entire world or the entire universe. Okay, so in the next chapter, chapter two of Aristotle's On the Heavens, he's going to talk about the universe as a whole. That is its size and its parts and so on. So let's stop here for now and we'll pick up next time.